and that, that's one of our problems, isn't it? We're just not very good at slowing down and recognising blessings and, and enjoying recollections of God's thankfulness. And that's, this psalm is going to take us in this direction. But the question is, where does Moses go next? When he stands and, and says, he's on this mountain, he goes, Lord, I know you've been faithful. I know you've been our safe dwelling place. Where does he go next? Well, if, if God is our reality, then Moses spends a little bit of time thinking about his frailty. Now, I wonder whether you've done that. You're never encouraged to do that, really, to slow down and say, hold on, let, let, let me just take stock of what it really means to be human here. You're just encouraged to just go for it with un- unthinking, unthinkingly. Well, not here. I wonder whether somebody would read for us nice and loudly these four verses as we think on those just for a second. Somebody read that. Go for it, Matty. Have you noticed that? Isn't that almost a little bit miserable? We're here one day, gone the next, and very few people will notice us. That's a bit of a kick in the pride, isn't it? That's not much good. In fact, should we test this? Okay. Put up your hand if you had a great, great granddad. I'll give you a clue. You all had a great, great granddad. Put up your hand if you know his name. (laughs) Okay. Ian, can you remember your great, great granddad's name? What was his name? John, do you know what he did? Go on, tell us. So he's definitely forgettable than a politician in Liverpool. Brilliant. But apart from Ian, I mean, I could ask you your great, great, great granddad's name. Who's, he's your own flesh and blood. You don't even know his name. You don't know what he did or where he lived or, or what he smelt like. You haven't got a clue. Why is that? It's because we're here one day and we're gone the next. Now imagine that we as a church have a massive impact in speak. And it could be that we do that. And for a little while, we'll feel really significant. In fact, we have so much impact in speak that they start naming roads after us. So what you've got is you've got, instead of, uh, I don't know, Central Way, you've got Stevenson Way. Or you've got Wall Walk. (laughs) Or you've got McMahon Boulevard. Okay, you've got um, Gillett Green. Would that work for you? Uh, Oh, Fisher Close. (laughs) How about that? And I'll tell you what will happen. In one generation time, nobody will know who you are. Who was the person they named Stevenson way after? Sounds like a bit of a divvy to me. You know, nobody will remember us. We are here one day and we are gone the next. He laughs, does the Lord, at any ways in which we try to make ourselves think that we are bigger than we really are. Look at this. You turn men's back back to dust. That's a bit of a, a, a thinking back to the Garden of Eden. Do you remember that Adam was made out of dust and when sin came into the world, he was returned to dust. And it's all under the Lord's control. For a thousand years in your sight are like a day that has just gone by or like a watch in the night. So if I understand that correctly and I've done my maths correctly, it means that a year in your life is like 90 seconds to the Lord or something like that. Or, or no, 90 minutes to the Lord. I, I worked it out earlier on my calculator and I can't remember it, okay? He's here all the time, you are not. Now why is that really important? Because it means we will be very cautious about going to God and say, you should have done this or I know better than you. Our wisdom, you know, we're around for a few decades. In fact, some of us are around for in, into teenage numbers and we think we know. We think we've arrived. And to be honest with you, to God, that looks a little bit sweet and pathetic. Now, I'm really glad my little Poppy's in here. She's just grown out of a certain phase. Poppy, can I tell everybody about something that you do? Would that be all right? Okay. I'm going to do it anyway. Uh, <laughs> She's, and it's been wonderful this year. She's just been learning that the world is a great and exciting place. And so what Poppy will do is just randomly, she'll go, do you know that grass, it's green? Do you know that tap thing when you 
twist it, water comes out. Mm. And I think that's wonderful that you tell me all these things because you've been around a few years and you think you know and you need to tell me all these things as if it's the first time I've ever met them. Now we can be a little bit like that with God, can't we? Okay. Sometimes we can feel that God could sort of need our advice, and I wonder whether the th- same thing, sort of thing, would work out with Poppy. I mean, I'm having a difficult day. Perhaps the bills have come in, and I'm like, how am I going to make all this money, or lack of it, pay the bills? And so I go to Poppy and I go, Poppy, I just, I'm in a bit of a jam here. I've got to pay the bills, Poppy. And she looks at me and she goes. Do you know, here's the thing about money, Daddy. Well, it comes in paper and metal. How do you like them apples, Daddy? And I'd be really happy if you did help me like that, Poppy. But it wouldn't help me because I've been around a little bit longer and you really don't understand the state of the situation, do you? And yet sometimes with God, we can think we have arrived. A few decades and we think we have cracked it. No, 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 no. He is God. We are not. We like to sometimes think that God is the ethereal passing one who's distant. And no, no, no. He's the one who is permanent and here. He is God. We're not. We're the ones who are passing. Look at that there. Do you notice it? You sweep men away in the sleep of death. They are like the grass of the morning. Some of you here work in gardens. You'll know that you mow the lawn, it grows up, it gets cut, and whoosh, it's gone. We're a little bit like that. Though in the morning it springs up, by evening it is dry and is withered and has gone. So I, I suppose you could summarise your life and mine as, ready? Uh, sown, grown, blown, and this one's a bit of a force, gone, gone. <laughs> Okay, okay, should we try to say that together? Okay, our lives are sown, grown, blown, gone. Okay, that's, no offense, but that's all your life is. So we were at a, a wonderful prize giving celebration for one of the girls up at the school, and the, the message that was put across by all the photos was You guys are heroes! You're the next generation! You're awesome! Life's all about you, and you can be anything you want to be and do anything you want to do. No. You are sown, grown, blown, gone. And we need to recognize that, don't we? We need to remember that that is who we are. When we think God is the passing illusory one, it's as if we're trying to play God and we cannot. So what are we being told? Moses, as he sits on that mountain and he writes this psalm at the end of his life, he's like, whoa, that went fast. That went really, really fast. Okay. Last year, I've mentioned Tommy, I'll mention him again. How old did you hit Tommy? I'll I'll help you out. He seems to have lost his tongue. He hit 60. Okay. Now, there's a few of us in this room who are going to hit mile markers in life in this coming year. Okay. Jane, I can speak for her. I wouldn't speak for myself. Jane's going to be 40 this year. Oh, dear me. Oh, yeah, so am I. (laughs) So's the other Jane. So's Kosh. And some of you are sitting there going, I wish I was only going to be 40 this year. (laughs) Some of you are going, whoa, 25's like ancient, dude. Whoa. Can I tell you, it goes like... That, doesn't it? In fact, we're going to see in a minute in one of the Bible verses that you were only supposed to be, have 70 or 80 years if you are strong, which basically means, Vi, you're living by grace, aren't you, my dear? Aren't you? You're highly blessed and incredibly strong, fellas. When you find a, a young lady, marry somebody as strong as Vi, okay? By means of strength, she's more than 80 years old. That's quite good going biblically, all right? Tommy Mackey's hoping he gets there, okay? Our lives are gone fast. So at the start of this year, we should say, well, how do we want to use those lives? Well, we're going to come back and think about that uh, a little bit more in a second. But before we do anything else, we need a piece of paper. 
Jason, you're near the back. There are some half A4 sheets of paper. Could you and Mark and other Mark dash round like whippets and make sure everybody has got one, please? Okay? Uh, Grown-ups, you need one. Teenagers, you need one. Kids, can you look over a grown-up shoulder? Uh, just the half A4 ones. That'll do. Dash them out. Make sure everybody's got one. Okay? Amy, you got the one very lucky one. You got one printed front and back because the printer messed up. Good. Okay, Amy, tell us, what's this one all about, please? It's for prayer week. Now, what I want you to do is just jump down to the bottom. Who's going to do that reading? Who have we got? Thanks, Sue. And I wonder whether you've spotted, thanks Sue, I wonder whether you've spotted how Moses is beginning to connect the dots. He said, God, you are from eternity. You are our dwelling place. We can't escape you. You are there. You are faithful. You've been good to us. And yet our days are numbered. We are, well, we said it, didn't we? We're sown, we're grown, we're blown, and we're gone. That's what happens. And he starts to put the pieces together to say, why is that? Why is it that our lives are so full of trouble and strife and toil, and then all of a sudden, we're gone? Is that giving us a message? Well, yes, it is. According to this, we are consumed by your anger and terrified in your, by your, uh, your indignation. Do you understand this? We're being told that the reason that we die is because there is something wrong between us and God. And that played out in Moses' experience. You see, Moses remembers how the, ch- the children of Israel had been delivered by um, the Lord from out from under Egypt. They'd gone through the Red Sea, gone to Sinai. He had presenced himself with them. And well, just a moment later, they're being unfaithful. They're living for themselves. They're moaning and grumbling. They're living as if God doesn't. They're trying to decide what to trust. And they'll trust almost anything except him. They'll build their lives and write their own story apart from God's. And Moses is putting this together and going, I'm not surprised you, you, you've limited the number of years that we shall live. Because we just make it worse and worse and worse. We sin against you and you are understandably angry for the mess that we have brought into our lives and into the lives of other people. You know, whenever the Lord says don't, we sometimes get a bit itchy, don't we? We think he's being mean and restrictive. But whenever the Lord says don't, what he's actually saying is don't hurt yourself. He has wired and wound up the world in such a way that, well, if you don't live according to who he is and, uh, and, and how he's made us to be, then it will hurt. To choose to sin is to choose to suffer. And in fact, he sees it. You have set our iniquities before you, our secret sins, in the light of your presence. In other words, everything we do, everything that the children of Israel did that was to write their own story and do life their own way, was done immediately in their, in his presence as if to shake the fist at him. It was personal. Who here got any Duplo? Who here got any Sylvanian families, any Playmobil, any Lego? Anybody get any of that this Christmas? What did you get? What did you get? Uh, The oil tanker, what, in Duplo? Lego, okay. Have you built it? And did you put all the little figures right in place on the oil tanker? Okay. So imagine you go into Weston's home, okay, and he's built, how long did it take you to build? Five minutes. Whoa, you're like, it's like, wow. Okay, it can't be very complicated one. It's like this one for like five to eight year olds or something. Five to seven, and you chose to build that? I'm sure the illustration will still play. 
Okay. So he's lovingly put effort into creating this beautiful little thing, put the figures, he's imagined the story with which it's going to go, and he's looked back on his oil tanker, and he's gone, this is good, this is right. And then somebody comes knocking at the door, Who? Uh, John. John comes knocking at the door, and he walks in and he sees the oil tanker, and he goes, no, I could have done better. In fact, I don't really like that. And immediately he starts to play with it and he takes this piece off, takes that pair, moves that guy from there. And, and what have you done to my oil tanker? I'd made it and it was good and it tested my brain and it, it's a reflection of me and my creative. <gasps> oh, what have you done with my little thing? All I did was move a few. No, no, you've done something with my little oil tanker. <laughs> You see, whenever we take our lives and say, God, I don't want to do it your way. I'm going to build a little world, write my own story, do my own little thing. You do that in his presence and it's against him. And he sees it all. It's all there. And so all our days pass away under your wrath. We finish our years with a moan. Life's got hard because we've not got it done it God's way and his anger is sitting over us and that's why we die. The length of our days is 70 years, or 80 if we have the strength, or 80 plus if we're awesome, called Vi. This is a, and 98 if you're Ron. He's got to, he must be blessed, okay? Yet their span is but trouble and sorrow, for they quickly pass away and we fly away. I'm guessing that if you asked anybody who's moving on in years, one of the big themes of what they talk about will be how hard life is. Isn't it a relief that the Bible isn't pretending that life is awesome all the time like so much on telly does? It tells us the truth and gives us an understanding as to why life in this world is so often toil and struggle. Who knows the power of your anger? As in, who wants to even think about this? We don't want to think about this, do we? In fact, I remember a close relative of mine who had a brush with death, and it looked like he, you know, he might have got a terminal illness, but he's okay now, and that's okay. And I spoke to him afterwards, and I was like, what did you learn from your brush with death? I thought maybe it would have taught him of his own mortality and the fact that perhaps he needs to seek God in God's world. But it was like, I think I want to buy a yacht. I think I want to get some more toys. In other words, he just developed a rather pathetic looking bucket list. I wonder whether you've got one of those. One of those little lists of these are the things I need to do before I die. And I wonder whether at the top of those lists is make sure I'm knowing, living for, and I'm right with the true and living God. If that one isn't at the top of your list, then the the rest are just irrelevances and they will be blown away like the grass of the field. He asks us, this psalmist Moses, as we read this, to say, Who knows the power of your anger? For your wrath is as great as the fear that is due to you. Are you ready to meet God? And of course, there's one person who does know the power of God's anger. Who is it? Who is it who knows what it means to bear God's anger on behalf of others so that they can have a future? So that their life won't just be snuffed out at the end of 70 or 80 or if you're Superman, Ron, 98 years. Well, let's hope he gets a few more as well, gets his telegram. Okay? Who is it who knows what it is to face the anger and bear it for others? Jesus. He's the only one who really knows because he's the only one who's been through it and faced God's anger, not for his sin, but for ours. He is our sin bearer. So at the same time as we see that God is angry at our sin, we see that he is full of love because in that same moment of Jesus Christ, God's anger was satisfied by his loving sacrifice of Jesus Christ in our place. So he knows And he calls on us to, well, give him fear and honour him and respect him for that. And so all the way through the psalm up to verse 11, there's just been a statement of reality. So here's the question, and we need to finish up with these last few things. If we turn to these last few verses, we see what we're supposed to do about it in our life. Okay? Turn over, oh sorry, click over for us for the next one. Could somebody read verses 12 through to 17 for us? Who's going to read that? I think you're just putting your hand up because it's fun, aren't you? Should we find somebody who's really confident? Go for it, Mark, really loudly.
Brilliant. You notice what has changed here in the singing of this psalm. As Moses has written it for people like you and me, for their families, for the kids, everybody to sing. What has happened has been a statement of fact. Now he does something that is the heart and the most authentic response. This shows whether you're a Christian or not. Only Christians will do this. What he does is he turns and he speaks to God. That is the essence of the Christian life. It is knowing God by turning your realities that you're facing in your heart and soul, over to him. He doesn't write a plan. He could have done. Maybe you've written a plan. It's a good thing to do, but he, he doesn't do that first. He could have set a vision, and setting a vision is a good thing to do. But he knows, does Moses, that we're not self-sustaining, self-reliant, independent creatures. He knows that we are written with a soul that is supposed to relate to God about everything we face. So what does he do? He cries out five quick things, okay? And this is, by the way, is the sort of things we're going to be focusing on in prayer week. He cries out, first of all, in verse 12, he cries out and says, Lord, I'm a stupid idiot. Can you see him saying that there? Teach us to number our days aright that we may gain a heart of wisdom. He's saying, I haven't got a heart of wisdom. It doesn't come naturally to me. I don't weigh up the realities of life properly. I don't see straight. I get dragged to all kinds of silly ideas. Lord, I'm an idiot. Please, I just confess my foolishness. I need your wisdom. I'm prone to making bad choices. Help me come from the outside and bring your grace in that I may be changed and made wise. He doesn't write a plan of it. You can't do that. The only way you get wise is knowing the wise one and having him in your life. So he says, please, Lord, come. Could you, could you help me to count and number my days? Now, listen, I don't know whether you've done your mathematics, but I'm a, if I'm nearly 40 and I, I'm, well, I'm not quite one of the strong ones to wait. So if I get to 70, that means 30 years, uh, 365 days a year, uh, 30 times 365, is around about 10,000. So I've got round about 10,000 days left. And that's if I don't get hit by a car when I'm out on my bike. All right? How many days have you got left? Quick, do your sums. Count them. Bethany, how many have you got left? A lot. You really think so? And this is the joy of youth. Can I tell you, that's the exact opposite to what this is saying. You ain't got very many. Ruth, how many have you got left? I don't know. See, this is the thing about sort of like when you're a teenager, you're like, no, nah, life's just going to go on. I can do whatever I like. Okay. When I'm young and I'm in school, I mean, 21. Dude, he's a fossil. You know, no. <laughs> you haven't got very long left. Lord, would you help me to value every day? Okay. If anybody here is over 50, I mean, let's face it, you are one foot in the grave. It's just, that's just, let's just face it. You're going to be gone like this, all right? No offence, Kev. Happy birthday, just before Christmas, okay? Don't worry, Tommy's 60. Anyway, let's... Um, we, oh, Lord, let me just make sense of that so that I don't waste my life. Next, what does he ask? Next one, okay? Uh, number 13, relent, O oh Lord, how long will, will it be? Have compassion on your servant. What does he cry out for? Number one, he cries out, help me to not be an idiot. Number two, he says, Lord, I need mercy, as I've, as I've watched the children of Israel wander through the desert and they've got wandering hearts that, that, that sin against you and mistreat each other and, and don't take responsibility for half the things. Lord, the thing I need more than anything else is not to look awesome or to be awesome or to get more toys. I need mercy from the true and living God. And that's why I'm coming to you, Lord, because you are the one who gives mercy. What do you ask for next? Number 14. Satisfy us. In the morning, with your unfailing love. Hold on, forget, just go, um, uh, just take the first six verses. So, so, first six words, I think it is. Hold on, yes, six. Satisfy us in the morning with, how would you fill out the rest of that? How would you fill it out? Satisfy me in the morning with ravishing good looks. A nice meal. 
satisfy me in the morning with peace and quiet and a wife who's marginally less unhinged. Satisfy me in the morning with kids who do as they're told and fulfill my dreams by living it out. Satisfy me in the morning with more toys, better achievements and a sense of my own worth. Oh Lord, just, just, just give me an easy life and make me content. What do you pray for in the morning? Here he says, satisfy me with your unfailing love. Did you get that? Unfailing love. Do you realize that any love that you have had from anybody else has been failing? But there's never been a point where the Lord's love to you has failed. Just grab hold of that for a moment. You may have faced this, you may have gone there, but at no point does the Lord ever go, do you know what, I'll let you down there. Because he never has. His love has been perfect to you every moment of your life without fail. The fact that you haven't been able to see it, that's not his fault. That's usually our own pride, our own set of expectations, our demands of God. Which of us as parents haven't failed our kids in our love? We've loved them, but we've failed them. God has never done that. His love is unfailing. It doesn't end. It won't go away. It won't let us down. You see, all those other things that we could say, satisfy my soul on, whether it's good looks, a nice meal, good results in exams, vengeance on my enemies, having a quiet life, having an understanding husband or wife, more toys, achievements, those things will all let us down. They will fail us. But every morning, get me up with a sense that the one thing that can never fail me is your love. Lord, make me rejoice or sing for joy and be glad all my days. So here we say, Lord, I'm stupid, make me wise. Lord, I need mercy when you see the state of my life. Lord, satisfy me with your unfailing love. Help me to, to, to focus in on that, that you've shown me this perfect love through Jesus Christ by forgiving me of my sins. Next one, 15 and 16. Make us glad for as many days as you have afflicted us, for as many years as you have, we have seen trouble. May your deeds be shown to your servants, your splendor to your children. Lord, I want to see you more. And don't we want to do that as a church? Don't we want to see God at work in our lives? Don't we want to see growth and change? Don't we want to be able to see those hidden spiritual realities? God at work, which he is all day, every day, but we sort of get blinded by it. We can't quite see it because we're so busy looking at all the other junk. Lord, would you, you purify my sight so I can see spiritual power and reality? Lord, we want to see you at work in our estates, changing lives, bringing people from darkness to light. We want to hear about in the news how you are, you are flattening the proud and being gracious to the needy and the oppressed. We want to hear of churches built in the most unlikely places all over the world. Lord, would you help me and my kids sit down together and go, whoa, look what the Lord can do. Lord, would you let me see that because I've got a wayward soul. I need to see you at work amongst us. That's what he prays for. And finally, you see it here. May the favour of the Lord our God rest upon us. Establish the work of our hands for it. Isn't that amazing? In a psalm where he said, basically, you're here and you're gone and you don't do much. He's daring to, pr- to pray that with God on board, we might do something that lasts into eternity. Can I just speak to the dads? Just for a second, fathers. May the favour of the Lord our God rest upon us, establish the work of our hands for us. It's linked to verse 16. Your splendour to their children. Listen, dads, we need to be thinking hard about leaving a legacy with our kids of who God is and the works of his hands. Now, I know you've got, as fellas, you've got all kinds of priorities coming up soon. There's all kinds of things that clutter in But make that your priority for this year, that you as a dad leading your home towards seeing and serving and building something that lasts long beyond uh, another certificate for football or for dance or another exam, uh, another exam results. As good as those are, be building a legacy in your family of, well, people who, who who know the Jesus story and love him and serve him and are on board serving his purposes while they have uh, time to do it. May the favour of the Lord our God rest upon us, establish the work of our hands for us. Yes, establish the work of our hands. That's his prayer, crying out to God. So we want to be a church more than anything else this year that is known as a bunch of people who know they need to cry out to God. For wisdom, for mercy, for satisfaction in the love of God, for 
Well, to see his works amongst us and to have our works in his name established into eternity. We're going to sing again now before we turn towards this. Oh, where's that pianist gone? <laughs>